Enterprise IT is the most fascinating industry in the world, but it is also among the most complex to comprehend. I know firsthand that getting started in this industry, trying to piece the puzzle together from breadcrumbs is cumbersome and frustrating. There are too many connected components and moving parts, and no single source of information for the basics. So let's change that. During the next 30 minutes, I will walk you through the big picture of the whole enterprise IT, giving you a solid foundation to hit the ground running with your career in the industry. This lightboarding story is also the introduction module of my new course, Introduction to Enterprise IT at the Tech Enthusiast Academy. It's a nine hour all-in-one course that teaches the very fundamentals of enterprise IT. Data centers, cloud, servers, storage, networking, edge, security, knowledge that everyone in the industry needs and usually takes months or even years to gain. For more information, check the links down below. Now, let's dive headfirst into the exciting world of enterprise IT. All right, so let's get started with the fun stuff, and that's enterprise technologies. Everything related to clouds and data centers and edges and AI and stuff like that. But before we dive deeper into each of these technologies, I just wanted to give you an overview of what we are going to go through during this course. And as you might have deducted from the name of the course, this course is all about two things, main topics. The first one being data centers. And the second one about cloud. Data centers and clouds. Those are the two main topics that we are going to talk about during this course. Let's start with the data center. What do we have in a data center? What makes a data center tick? What components do we need? How do we need to configure them and so on? So let's start with the maybe most familiar components, which are computers or servers, as we call them in a data center environment. We probably have dozens or maybe even hundreds or thousands of these servers or compute nodes in one data center. And usually we make them work together. They are not just individual servers doing their own thing, but we want to make them work as a part of a bigger environment, working together on a single big task, or at least be part of a single so-called cluster so that we can leverage the power of multiple servers to do something. And in servers and in data center environments, even though these servers, they do have their internal storage capacity, so we can store some data in them. They have a few hard drives here and there, but most of the times, that's just not enough. We have so vast amount of information, all the data that we need to deal with coming in all the time, that we cannot just possibly fit all of that inside these servers. And that's why we have in data centers separate dedicated storage devices. It's just a big machine full of hard drives, full of spinning disks or SSDs, providing tons of capacity, a lot of it to all of these servers, all of these individual servers that we have in this environment. Think of it like a Google Drive or a Dropbox. They all work in the same way. So we have a lot of storage capacity in these storage devices that are shared for all of those servers. So all of the servers, computers can access that shared massive amount of storage capacity. Then another thing that we want to have here is some kind of a backup device. They can be DAPE libraries or just normal servers that have a lot of storage capacity to make sure that we always have at least a duplicate data of this data that we have in this primary storage, as we call it. So if something happens to this production data, production environment, we still have the data as a backup. So we just copy all the data that we have there on that backup device. Then we of course need to have some kind of a network 
set up for this whole environment. We connect all of these servers to the same network so that they can communicate. And through this network, these servers, these computers get access to the internet as well and to other data centers and so on. So that's how we can have access to all those services, emails and, and you know, one drives and whatever we have through the network. These are the three main components of IT infrastructure in every data center around the world. We have compute, aka servers. Then we have storage. And the third one is networking. You will face those three terms throughout the course all the time. And we call that three-tier architecture, compute, storage, networking. And now that we have this construct in place, then we can start installing a ton of operating systems here in this compute environment. We can actually install more operating systems than we have servers. We only have three servers here, but through the magic of something that we call server virtualization, we can actually install multiple operating systems on one of these servers. That's truly magical, but we'll get back to that in a later modules. Then about cloud. So you might be comparing these two. So what's the difference between a data center and a cloud? And my claim is actually not that much. We have a data center in a cloud as well. Clouds are just a bunch of data centers. But there is one difference. There is this one tiny little difference. We put in this data center a lot more sophistication and automation in it. All of these huge cloud service providers, they have user interfaces like AWS and uh, Google Cloud and Microsoft Azure and IBM Cloud. And all of these guys, they have a website where you can just log in. You can uh, search for a suitable service, like I have just one two terabytes of storage capacity, or I want an email server. Uh, I want a database, whatever I want. And then I want, I, I define how much I want of that capacity, how many processors, there are nice sliders. I can choose how many virtual machines, how many gigabytes of memory, and so on and so on. And then you type in your billing details, your credit card number, whatever. Click OK. And then the magic of cloud starts to happen. It automatically gives you a small amount of the huge data centers ca capabilities and capacities. Some storage, some networking, and some compute capacity is now, from now on, dedicated to you. And you pay for the services only. You don't have to worry about setting up all of these complicated three-tier things. You don't have to worry about installing servers or storage devices, network. You don't have to know about any of that stuff. You just go to a website, Choose what you want, how long amount of time you want it, how many of them you want, click OK, and it's up and running. So that's the beauty of cloud. But now if you compare the two, you look at this. There's a data center, and there's a data center here. But the difference is this sophistication, automation, and virtualization there on the right-hand side. You might be wondering, what happens if we do the same here. If we put the same user interface, same kind of beautiful sliders here, tick boxes and text fields and uh, invoicing details and the OK button, what happens? Well, you guessed it. This becomes a cloud as well. Now we have two clouds. We have this right-hand side cloud and this left-hand side cloud. So this one here was available for everybody. This was AWS or Google Cloud or IBM Cloud or Microsoft Azure. And when it's available for basically anybody with a credit card, then it's called a public cloud. 
public cloud. This is your data center, only available to you and your employees, your organization. You manage everything here. You control the security. You control what services there are. You control how much storage capacity and what kind of storage there is, what kind of backups, what kind of networking. Everything is under your control. And this cloud here is servicing your needs only. That's why it's a private cloud. The difference is basically just that. They can be identical. I can take all of these hardware components from this left-hand side of the picture and move them here in this public cloud environment. And it's still exactly the same. The difference is what kind of an environment and users and customers are we servicing. So that's the only difference. Both are clouds, and both are equally doing the same thing, servicing users in an easy, as a service manner. Now, for example, in this data center on the right hand side in the public cloud, we still need to take care of a proper power or electricity uh, or provide enough electricity to you know, power up all the IT devices, servers, storage, and networking. We also need to take care of cooling down the hot air that all of these devices create. Power and cooling is important. We also have to take care of other kind of supporting infrastructure, which includes fire suppression, humidity control, and so on and so on. The same applies to this data center as well. So all data centers need, in addition to these three IT tiers, compute, storage, and networking, they all need supporting infrastructure, power, cooling, fire suppression, humidity control, physical security, all of those things. We will discuss those things in a separate module as well. Now, a little bit uh, different approach to this three-tier architecture, where we had three separate components, we can use something a bit more sophisticated. And that could be in the form of Hyperconvergence, for example, where we necessarily don't need external storage, like here. As I mentioned, we have an immense amount of data these days in data centers, in clouds, everywhere in the world these days that we need to take care of. So that's why we have these external dedicated um, data storage devices in data centers. But another approach is to cramp up these servers with large amount of storage devices, storage capacity, we have a lot of hard drives, spinning disks or SSDs these days more and more, but large amounts and high capacities. So we just put a lot of that storage inside here in the uh, servers. Then instead of having a lot of uh, networking devices, physical networking devices, we just have a lightweight network connecting these servers together. And we use something called network virtualization as well, which takes a lot of functionalities that we have in the physical switches and puts it in a software. So we don't need that many hardware devices. But we still need a cluster. So this would be still a cluster. But we just have fewer components and the functionality is driven by software. So. Another thing we can do is instead of running these operating systems on the servers and on, on top of this cluster, we can run something smaller. Instead of operating systems, we can just run applications here. The difference, this is called container environment, if you've heard of that. And this is server virtualization. Two different approaches to virtualization, which is truly the magic of cloud. Without virtualization, there wouldn't be any clouds. And that's the key, I would say, the key technology to all the clouds, all the highly automated data centers and also the clouds. We will spend a fair amount of time talking about both of these technologies throughout the course. So what about security? 
Security, in addition to artificial intelligence, is uh, one of the two biggest megatrends in the world of enterprise technologies. Everybody's talking about either cybersecurity or AI these days. And security is actually super interesting in these environments. Let's start with the private cloud. So of course, in the private cloud, when you talk about security, and remember what I mentioned, that everything is under your control. So you can decide what kind of servers, what kind of virtualization, what kind of storage backup and networking environments and devices you want to use. You can decide everything. How do you use them? How do you configure them? What services you provide? Equally, you can decide what kind of security measures you implement in your environment. You are in 100% total complete control of everything related to security here as well. So that's in a way, a simple way to do everything. Of course, there's a lot for you to do, but you don't have to worry about somebody else doing things in a way that you don't like them to be done. You don't have to rely on somebody else's decisions, which is the case with public cloud. So public cloud security is, on the other hand, in this way, lacking a little bit compared to the private cloud. You are not in any kind of control of the security that the, the private or the public cloud providers have decided to do in the public clouds. However, they have a responsibility towards all the customers that they are servicing in public cloud. So for that single reason, they are probably putting a lot of effort in making their security as watertight as possible. So objectively measured, public cloud providers are putting much more effort in making their clouds much more secure than typically private cloud providers. But then again, there's more interest for cyber criminals to attack public clouds most of the time than private clouds because there's just much more stuff going on here. Where things get interesting is when you mix and match. You don't have to do just either or. You don't have to choose between the two, that you only do private cloud or you only do public cloud. You can do both. And if you do both, that's what we call a hybrid cloud strategy. If the company has a hybrid cloud strategy, it means that we do have a private cloud of our own where we are running some of the applications and then some of the applications are running in the public cloud. And this is where security also gets a little bit tricky. So we have to now measure or take security measures in our private cloud, private environment for our private cloud applications. But at the same time, we have to be aware of public cloud security measures as well. In the worst case, we might have some applications that have resources running in the private cloud and in the public cloud. So then we have to be very careful of what security is implemented on this side and that side. We'll touch a little bit more about this, this uh, security uh, in the private and in the public environments in the course as well. What about then another strategy that you probably have heard of. If the company is using multiple public clouds, that's easy. That's when we talk about a multi-cloud strategy. You might be using multi-cloud strategy for multiple reasons, just simply because this public cloud doesn't have some services that you need. It has most of them, so of course you're using this one, but you have to use another one because there's a service there that you want to use. So this might be AWS, that might be Google, that might be uh, Microsoft Azure. Another one is uh, availability. You cannot rely on one cloud because guess what? Clouds go down as well. There's downtime in clouds also. They are technological environments and technology is not perfect. There might be earthquakes, there might be power outages, there might be whatever happening in one of the data centers of the public cloud service provider. So that's why you might want to choose another one. So multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, there are a couple of more 
uh, cloud strategies as well that companies take. And again, we are talking about those in the later modules there. Now, I just said that the main components in the course is data centers and cloud. It, it might be true, but another, I would say a third equally big component in this picture should be edge computing. So what is the edge? Some say that that's, that's the real world. <laughs> that's where stuff happens. That's where we are creating data and information with our phones, with our tablets and laptops and uh, cameras and everything. That's where most of the processing capacity of the entire world's computers and processors is happening, if not now, in the future at least. So edge is where the data is being created. We have our laptops, We have uh, surveillance cameras that are creating data all the time with their footage. We might have also uh, self-driving cars. We might have uh, airplanes, cameras, Lots of mobile phones, and so on and so on. We can have production line sensors, we can have retail store point of sales, everything that creates data and stores it somewhere and is connected to the network. Your smart toothbrushes, your gaming consoles, uh, fridges, your televisions, your lights, and home surveillance monitor. You have, we have so many connected devices these days that we don't even realize. Some estimations say that the connected devices in the edge or at the edge of the world, including IoT devices, our mobile phones, our laptops, that number could be roughly 100 billion devices that have processors in them and they are connected to the network. So there's a lot of these devices. And each and every one of these devices, they have some kind of a processor in them, some computational capacity. So as I mentioned, there's a huge shift happening at the very moment. And if you would combine, if you, if you would be able to see the whole combined computational capacity of the world, all the devices at the edge, all the mobile phones and, and the cameras and tablets and laptops and data centers and servers, clouds, all the processor capacity, you put it together, you have it all here. And then you look at it, how it's distributed in the world. More and more, the proportional amount of computational capacity is distributed and being distributed at the edges, outside of the clouds and data centers. So we are living in a heavily distributed world and we are going to live in an even more computationally distributed world in the future. That doesn't mean that clouds are going anywhere. They are in the crawl part off the edge as well. We need to send information back to clouds from self-driving cars every now and then, from our laptops equally. Surveillance cameras are storing footage in the centralized location. We need to send our photos fo from the mobile phones every now and then back to the cloud. There's some artificial intelligence training happening in the cloud for the planes. We are sending our pictures and footage to the cloud for editing or whatever. Cloud will be integral part of this future as well. Only the computational capacity will not be proportionally 
that much centralized in the cloud as it used to be, but it's distributed at the edges. I want to mention one specific, very, very interesting and weird thing actually that we can do now that we have all these technologies in our hands. This is, this is truly magical that we have here, all this technology at our fingertips. We can do plenty of magical things. One of them is this. Imagine you have a tablet with no operating system. You just have a tablet with a touch screen and that's it. Instead of an operating system running here on this tablet, we make the operating system to run here in the data center. This can be 500 kilometers apart. You have your tablet at home connected to the network, but the operating system is actually running here in the data center. So the iOS would not be running here on your iPad, but it's installed here in the data center. So how is that possible, you must be thinking? Well, imagine it this way. So this is just your monitor and you have a 500 kilometer long HDMI cable going from your monitor to this data center where the actual computer is running your iOS. So you're just looking at what's happening remotely 500 kilometers away. So you can run whatever here, have whatever device here, your tablet, your uh, laptop, your mobile phone, your desktop, whatever you have, and you connect to this iOS device or uh, iOS uh, operating system that's running here in this data center. As long as you can connect, as long as you have internet connection, you can do that. This magical technology is called VDI or virtual desktop infrastructure. We have a whole interesting module to talk about VDI as well. Just as an example, what kind of magical things we can do when we have this construct in place. So in the course, we will go deep into how servers work. We have multiple modules on different kinds of servers, different uh, server types and server virtualization, comparing server virtualization to the containers. We will also talk about networking, how we connect servers together with the Ethernet networking so that they can communicate together and also provide access to the outside world, to the Internet, when we are running these services in the data center. We spend a lot of time talking about storage. Storage is maybe the most important part if you have to choose uh, in the data center because you can lose everything else. You can lo lose uh, networking and servers. You can buy just more of them. But if you start losing data, that's when things really get serious. So we talk about storage arrays. What is a storage array? How is it different to storing data on computers? We talk about storage area networks. We have a different separate network that is actually used to communicate between servers and storage devices. We talk about backup. We talk about different types of uh, storage, uh, like uh, block storage, file storage, and object storage. We talk about cloud native storage and so on. A lot of modules about storage there. We talk about basic fundamental elements that we have to have in the data center for the IT to work, powering, cooling, humidity control, uh, fire suppression, the supporting infrastructure that we need to have there. We talk about business continuity on a data center level. What do we need to do to make sure that if one data center is out of order, we still have our services running on another data center? How do we do that? We talk about different kinds of clouds. We talk about public clouds, private clouds. What are the differences? What are the advantages of using hybrid cloud strategies? or multi-clouds or cloud only or cloud first strategies. What about hybrid multi-cloud? We talk about VDI, as I mentioned, super interesting stuff. We talk about the edge as well, as I said, the way of the future that's already here today. Super, super interesting stuff. We cannot talk about enterprise technologies without artificial intelligence. So we will take a look at the data centers of today, how they are different to data centers that were running traditional workloads like virtual machines and, uh, and databases and all the traditional uh, workloads. How different those AI data centers are 
or are they? Told you, fascinating stuff. Now, if you want to learn it all, head over to Tech Enthusiast Academy and subscribe to our newsletter to be the first to know when we release new courses and videos. All the links still down below. Thanks for watching and see you with the next one.